Hi, everyone. Welcome to Laughing Place Movie Club. I'm joined today by Rebecca. Hi. Hi, Alex. Thanks for inviting me. I'm excited. Thanks for coming. And our movie selection of the week is Rogers and Hammerstein's Cinderella, not the one with Julie Andrews, not the one with Leslie Ann Warren, but the one with Brandy and Whoopi Goldberg that was uh, produced with Disney for The Wonderful World of Disney on ABC back in 1997. And I've been a super fan of it since I would say before it premiered, because I remember all the Disney Channel interstitials leading up to it. Um, but this version is new to Rebecca, who I, um, in my life, is the biggest Cinderella fan that I know. So I was curious if you could start with just what is your introduction to Cinderella? Um, which version is it? And why do you love it so much? Oh, okay. Well, for me, um, Cinderella is uh, the classic 1950 Disney animated version. But honestly, because back growing up, I didn't have access to VHS or DVD or T even TV screenings of it. I would just go to the theater every few years, right? And it would it would be in, in theater. So really it was storybooks. And I actually have a small children's book that um, my parents read to me and I memorized it. And people used to think I could read at a really young age because I could recite it and turn the pages um, appropriately. So um, that's kind of my introduction to Cinderella. I I am a huge Cinderella fan. I tend to be very uh, defensive and uh, very what oh like somewhat. I kind of have my fists up whenever a new version comes to challenge my view of what Cinderella is as defined by uh, that 1950 uh, uh, movie. So yeah, that's me. Indeed. Did your fandom of the Disney version of Cinderella lead you to read like the versions it was based on? Have you read like Perot's version? Um, have you seen a lot of other film adaptations? I'm familiar with the more, um, I'll say grotesque, the more, uh, yeah, grotesque versions that have existed kind of in folklore. Um, I've read a few of the international stories that are a very similar Cinderella-like tale. Over the years, I've watched a few of the other versions. Um, Drew Barrymore, I believe she Ever was after. in. Yeah, I, um, I remember that one. Um, I did, Hillary did a version, right? There was one yeah, that was a actually, Hillary there's Duff a style. Series, but a Cinderella story was like a modernized 2004-ish um, take on a Teen, modern day teenager as Cinderella where swap, swapping out the glass slipper for a cell phone um, and then branching off of that there have been like five or six made for TV or direct to DVD iterations that have included Selena Gomez um, uh, what's her name from Freeform um, the brown haired girl uh, from I think the uh, what's that show where they're solving murders as teenagers Secret Life for You no, I'm, it's not ringing a bell. It's not one of those. Um, one um, of the, like the Little Liars or one of yeah, those one of the reform shows. Yeah, one of the Little Liars. Okay. Had to return. Um, so Sophia Carson recently did oh. one. So okay. it's just become like this mill of like you're you've done your rounds at Disney as a teenager, and now you get to do one of these Hillary Duff Cinderella story movies. It's a uh, menudo, I see. Yeah, <laughs> and there's a lot of them. They like do one every other year or something like that. Uh, but yeah, there's been a lot. And then obviously Disney made their own live action. Um, Kenneth Branagh. Yeah, with, directed by Kenneth Branagh, which kind of married the Disney um, 1950 movie with some of the Perot elements that they didn't include. Obviously there's Cinderella in Into the Woods, where if you search Cinderella on Disney+, Plus, you get Into the Woods as an option. <laughs> um, and that kind of merges in some of the Grimm Brothers mm. variations. I think the Grimm version of Cinderella is where the stepsisters cut off toes. Yes, and a little, <laughs> yes. To, fit, to fit within the shoes, they slice off parts of their feet. And then yeah. if I recall correctly, when they show up at the wedding, the birds pick, peck their eyes out. Yep. Stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah lovely. Just, yeah. Delightful bedtime. <laughs> now, now uh, did, this is, oh, sorry. Did, no, did Cinderella pop up in the Once Upon a Time ABC? She did, series? but not well realized. Um, 
And and so that was one of the disappointments. You had obviously like Snow White as a big major character. Mm -hmm. Cinderella, they kind of started to tease in season one. And then she really didn't stick around very long. She was mm -hmm. a resident of Storybrooke, but she never became part of the like main crew. And yeah. then we did try to redo Cinderella in that last season where they kind of reset the wheel and nothing worked anymore. And then Cinderella was a bigger part of that ver that season, but they'd already introduced a different Cinderella um, and everyone was just very confused. Okay. We do, we do have a, a comment on your hat. Yes, I, um, and yes the my hat is bent. Yes, the lack of cabinets at yeah, our house. Sorry, no, I just, yeah, nice, no. Nice Cinderella blue. Yeah. Uh, now this is obviously an adaptation of Rogers and Hammerstein's Cinderella, which actually debuted just a few years after Disney's with Julie Andrews in the lead role. Were you familiar prior to this Disney version with any other Rogers and Hammerstein Cinderella version, I, either Julie Andrews or Leslie Ann Warren? I was vaguely familiar with the Leslie Ann Warren version in that I knew it would air regularly and I, and I knew it's, role kind of in the history of TV in that um, Julie Andrews had had uh, played the role and they had made uh, Rogers and Hammerstein actually created this to be a TV produced Broadway style uh, presentation that was then presented live and it was an enormous um, you know kind of one of those moments in time television wise where a lot of America was tuning in and uh, and then years later, the Leslie Ann Warren version was done, and it became kind of an annual, um, uh, rep repeated broadcast that people would kind of have fond memories of. But for myself, I hadn't really um, none of the songs in it had ever really connected with me very well, mm. and so I think that's part of why I didn't. Even like this one, I was telling you was was we started that this was my first time finally like watching this. Um, this actually came to the Disney company in the midst of like my really passionate Disneyland attendance time. So if I didn't see very much of the wonderful world of Disney in the late 90s because I was at the parks Saturday night until close and Sunday night until close. So I did it. I didn't watch as much of Wonderful World, of, and this is one of the shows that I can remember seeing all the promotion for, and in and people really hyped for. But I myself didn't end up watching. Yeah, I would re I would say this was probably the first big original movie of the reboot of Wonderful World of Disney on ABC. I think which mm -hmm. started around '96, and they had done a lot of you know made for TV movies, but this was the first musical. Kind of kickstarted a trend where then every winter they had a new one lined up. After this was Annie. Um, they did Music Man. Um, uh, Pinocchio's in there, right? You no, know, Geppetto. Yeah, Geppetto, Geppetto was their yeah. original one, um, and then the. Uh, Once Upon a Mattress, The Princess and the Pea. Oh, musical. okay, yeah. Um, so they kind of did, it, it kind of kickstarted this thing, but this was the first one. And I was very familiar with the Leslie Ann Warren version from its repeated airings on Disney Channel. So I already knew the songs. And then when they started advertising this, I was, I just kind of like, my little mind went crazy. They would show all these behind the scenes uh, clips on Disney Channel of like how they did the ballroom scene or how they made her dress transform. So I was glued to the TV with my blank v VHS tape in the recorder to record it because <sighs> I could already tell I was going to watch this again and again. Um, and uh, and then I did um, forever uh -huh. until, until I got a DVD copy. But being that this was your first time seeing, I guess, any version of Rodgers and Hammerstein's Cinderella from start to finish and Disney's adaptation of it specifically. I'm curious to know your thoughts overall. Um, like what um, are your first impressions? I I enjoyed it more than I expected to, but it also had, um, I also was surprised how I, I wasn't very taken with the prince. Mm. I, 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 found, I found him a little bland. Okay. Um, his, his I, I guess his songs, not not like the character personally, but like the the songs that he was given, mm -hmm. um, I think would fall into my least favorite of the soundtrack. Um, it's funny yeah. you say that because the ahead. songs that were given to him in this were added. Oh, <laughs> for okay. The okay. Okay. So he doesn't have as big of a singing role in the original. Ah, okay. And then the song that the stepsisters sing outside of the ball, the stepsisters. Mm -hmm. Okay, 
total flash to um for me enchanted the mm. happy working song mm -hmm. the the way the the melody is I, I found it reminiscent and to the point where i made my husband listen to it and i'm like what song is this reminding me of because this is driving me crazy but yeah it was happy working song um whitney's amazing mm -hmm. i i really i really enjoyed her performance as the fairy godmother and the when she and brandy are singing together I really, I really, those are like, for me, like the high highlights of the film. Mm -hmm. And um, I also, uh, Bernadette Peters, I think this is um, um, among, she's like, for me, the high, whenever Bernadette Peters or Jason Alexander were on screen, I was, I found myself to completely engaged. They're just, their mm -hmm. performances were really fun. I agree. Those were always the things that really stuck out to me. And I, I found the movie to be weirdly quotable, but it was the kind of thing where nobody knew what I was quoting until I made a friend in high school inquire who was also a super fan. <laughs> and so I was telling Benji, but our my first time going to Disneyland was with a school choir trip. And we drove by Disneyland Park and couldn't see the castle and repeated one of the lines the stepsister says, um, where she's like, I want a chance at him when she's at the ball waiting for her turn. With the, to dance with the prince. Yeah. And we were like, where is it? We want a chance at it. Like, why can't we see the castle? <laughs> we were quoting it. Um, so <laughs> cool. Cool. Oh, it but was yeah. fun to see Universal Studios. Which the back I will, lot. I will say I knew this movie so well, but I did not connect that it was Universal until watching it again on Disney Plus. And then I had this moment, I was like, that's little Europe. Yeah. <laughs> like that's where they are. Cause in my head, I just thought they had like built this village and then tore it down later. Um, Cause it looked so unique, I guess with all the painting on all the buildings that kind of added all this. Exactly, yeah, the, the color palette. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then the other the other moment that caught me during that, that sequence there, which I love the Rob Marshall you know, dance extravaganza on the streets is when Jason Alexander is kind of tossed. He he gets the alcohol, right? He mm -hmm. has the bottle and it's squirting and he's just kind of there. And it totally reminds me of that, of a similar imagery from Fan in Fantasia, mm. right? Of the, of the, of the, of the uh huh. Yeah. It was, it was a very Bacchus moment. And I, I wondered if that was deliberate or, mm. or not, but uh, yeah, it caught, caught my eye in the midst of that performance, so. Yeah, I'd be curious to know, because um, I mean, there's a fascinating story behind how this version even came to be, which really started with Whitney Houston. It didn't start necessarily at Disney, but it was Whitney Houston who took the initiative, wanted to make an updated version of Cinderella. It was her vision to do it in a colorblind way. Um, and originally she was thinking she would play Cinderella and then as production ramped up and she became a producer, she kind of stepped back and said, I can't play this character and produce this movie at the level I want to, but I can be the fairy godmother. And then um, my understanding is they didn't have auditions, but she was kind of already mentoring Brandy, who was far enough in her career. She already had you know, her TV show, Moesha, um, and had made a name for herself in the music industry. So um, she was one of the roles that they just kind of offered out. Mm -hmm. um, Whoopi Goldberg was another one. They just, you know, asked, do you want to do this? But Bernadette Peters, my understanding is she was the second choice. Bette Midler was who they had in mind and they offered it to her. And when she realized that she would be the white stepmother of a black Cinderella treating her that way, um, said, nah, -uh, I'm not, <laughs> not taking that role. Uh, thankfully, Bernadette Peters had no qualms about it because she does it so brilliantly. Um, and I think now, you know, 20 years later, kind of looking back on it, because um, I saw it as like a 12 year old, right. my blinders were on. And I was just like, you know, it doesn't matter that anyone's what anyone's skin colors is. This is just a great movie. Um, but seeing it now with that retrospective, you can kind of see why Bette Midler might have been very hesitant to step well, into that role. But I think the creative team behind this did such a brilliant job of diversity that mm -hmm. I, I think you would have been hard pressed to kind of pigeon them into, you know, specific uh, race roles, let's say, um, because, you know, uh, Bernadette, the stepmother has uh, ch uh, her step, the, the daughters, her mm -hmm. Cinderella stepsisters are not the same race. Right. And, and then, you know, you have the in, in, in entire spectrum uh, there with the royal family, you know, mm -hmm. so I 
so I, like I said, I think they did a, a really brilliant job of kind of not allowing you to put your own, if you, if you came to it with your own um, baggage in that way, I, I don't think you could have carried it forward. But I had read that similarly, that they initially had had some challenges um, casting the, the, the stepmother for, for that reason, because there was concern over the perception um, in the era. So yeah, um, but Bernadette's so delightfully wicked. Yeah. Um, uh, so I, I had in, I enjoy her from Annie. So that's mm -hmm. what, what would, would have been, you know, when I would have seen at the time, this would have been the role that I would have thought for her. Uh, I would have thought of her in Annie. I had um, I had seen Annie, but I guess I didn't recognize her as um, Lily St. Regis, <laughs> the room service uh, in in this. So to me, this was what I knew Bernadette Peters from and then wow. found out she was Rita on Animaniacs. And then like in my little head, I was just like, oh, she's this like Broadway legend um, right. got to be in Cinderella. Because um, that's another fun part about this production is that while they went with most of the casting of fairly well-known people, there were a few exceptions. Um, it's easy to forget now that Victor Garber was not very recognizable at the time. Um, and I, I've read that he came off of Titanic onto this and Titanic was his first movie. So this was his second. Um, and, and he apparently totally underplayed it. He would just yeah. tell them, "Oh, I was working on this water set down in in Mexico." He yeah. like no, he didn't you know spill the beans. So yeah, the actor who plays the prince, Paolo Montalban, um, this is one of his uh, first and and very few films that he's done. He's mostly mm -hmm. a theater actor, and so he and Victor Garber he kind of bonded with him and was like, "Are you used to this?" "No, me neither." And he was like, "Yeah, I did this one film. You know, we filmed down in 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 L.A. or whatever." and um, yeah, it was wet the whole time and it was it was a bad experience. And then that movie was Titanic. <laughs> so it's so incredible. But to, that's one of the things that struck me in watching this was so you have Victor Garber, who's about to be in a blockbuster. Mm -hmm. right? It hadn't it hadn't hit, hit theaters yet. You have Jason Alexander, who's in the midst of the Seinfeld, you know, peaks of Se Seinfeld. And he yeah. had very limited time to be able to do anything other than the role of George Costanza, but he and surprisingly came theater. from a, a musical theater background and was really mm -hmm. excited to do something with that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that right. And so it's just it's funny to just think about the the star power that that you had um, along with obviously Whitney Houston herself. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, just a, a legendary performer. I can't I can't even envision what that must have been like to get the call and then to walk out on the set. Did you get to watch, I guess Entertainment Weekly had a fantastic like Zoom reunion yeah. of, of all the cast when this was announced coming to Disney Plus. I did, I, I was super excited to um, to not only watch that, but I, I wrote up a little recap of it for um, Laughing Place. Uh, and that was, that was really fun um, to see them reconnect. And sadly, uh, one of the two of the stepsisters passed away um, just a year before. So they kind of had a, a moment of tribute to her as well. Um, but that was, that was really fun. It was also fun to get to see into their homes. Um, because you, know, you wonder, you know, Bernadette Peters lives in, you know, what has to be a really nice penthouse in New York City. And so you right. get to see bits of it uh, in those Zoom calls. And that is, I think, up on YouTube uh, for anyone yes. who wants to watch it. It's about yeah. Yeah, I caught a little bit of it today after I, I watched because I I was taken aback by once I finished watching it and I had, I enjoyed it immensely. And I remember at the time how enamored everybody was with the diversity without feeling like there was a need to explain it. It was mm -hmm. it just it, it, it was You're right. And and there was just this this universe and. And so, you know, it was fun now to know that there was all this excitement and that there had been people pushing and pushing and pushing for it to come to Disney Plus. And so I kind of, after I watched it, I went and, and dug up some articles and I can't believe like what a pivot point this is in so many other, like it's the first, I was telling you, it's the first domino in so many other dominoes mm -hmm. because like, um, oh, and her name's gonna escape me because I didn't write it down, but I wanna, is it Deborah Martin Chase? So uh, is, one of the co-producers who also yeah. do Princess Diaries. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So so she so she was involved in this, 
and then she went on to do Princess Diaries, and that obviously became this blockbuster, you know, hit. And then that gave her the opportunity to to break ground to be um, to, with the Disney Company, and she had an intern. Shonda Rhimes, right? Mm -hmm. Who then did the Princess Diaries. So now you, you know you've got that piece connected to that. I was like I say, it was just as I kind of looked and saw like where how this had spread throughout the company and the industry as a whole. It was really impressive to to look into it in its history. And I totally there was articles in Essence. And um, that I really enjoyed, and so I was gonna. I was thinking. I gathered up the links, and when we're, I figured in the re, in the description below, I'd put some of the links to those other articles because it really is a, to me a, just a fascinating story to see how you know people were given opportunities, fully embraced, took. Com I don't want to say took advantage because that has a negative connotation, but just really. Mm -hmm capitalized on the opportunity and then brought others with them and just built up so many people through this one little pro you know this one seemingly little project it's very yeah. cool well and even rob marshall who did the choreography here his directorial debut was a year later with disney's version of annie um oh. which he brought victor garber along for um that's on disney plus too if anyone wants to go check it out and i wouldn't say they went the colorblind casting route but they did make um What's her name? The Daddy Warbucks is Grace. Uh, Grace. Is it Grace? Grace. Yeah, is played by um, having a brain fart from. She's the wardrobe in the newer Beauty and the Beast. Is Audra it Audra? Audra? Audra McDonald. Okay. So they definitely went with you know more um, diverse casting than uh -huh. than you were used to seeing in in that show in particular. And even the orphanage, like Annie's other other kids in the orphanage, were um, you know there was more representation among that group. So you can kind of see it kind of spawn from there. But this is, to my knowledge, the first and only like this that has been done on film. You'll see it in theater quite often. Like when we oh, saw right. Disney's Little Mermaid on Broadway, mm -hmm. King Triton was black, or Ariel's sisters were every color of the rainbow. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they had a lot more diversity um, in that show. And kind of like this, you know, you're stepping into a fairy tale world and there was no need to um, explain anything about it. But, um, you know, it's very special for that. And then there were a lot of things that they had to do with um, to expand it. I don't know if you're aware, but the previous versions of Rodgers and Hammerstein Cinderella were an hour long uh, TV musical. And this is 90 minutes with commercials making it a two hour event. So okay. they had to work with the Rodgers and Hammerstein team because everything has to be stamped with their approval um, to pull extra songs from their catalog. Um, that were not as well known because obviously you have things like Sound of Music and The King and I in Oklahoma where everyone can quote every song from those. Um, but they also have some less popular shows and they have some songs that were cut and never used. So that's where they pulled some of the extra songs from. And one of the things that I think is kind of interesting is uh, about 15 years after this, they actually adapted Cinderella for the stage and, and opened it on Broadway for the first time ever. And then that has toured around. And if you go see that show, the Fairy Godmother's added song from this, There Is Music In You, is a song that the Fairy Godmother sings um, twice, midway through, and then a big reprise at the end. Um, the stepmother's song, Falling In Love With Love, is repurposed mm -hmm. in that. That's not from the original version. Um, and then they pulled in some like cut songs from South Pacific and things like okay. that to kind of round out that version and make that a two hour show with intermission. <laughs> um, wow. But I thought it was interesting when we went to see that, um, that we had that. And the, the other thing that was cool about the casting for that after the initial, um, the original Broadway cast ran out, then they started to do some more names in it. So when I saw it, it was Carly Rae Jepsen as Cinderella and Fran Drescher as the stepmother. But then right after that, it was Kiki Palmer and Sherry Shepard. Um, and I, I'm curious to know if the discussions around that were anything like what uh, that Midler went through, thinking I don't want to be the bad person to a, a black Cinderella, and if they went with Sherry Shepard to have black stepmother, black Cinderella, and not have to worry about that, oh, either, wow. either conceived or from an actor. Right, right, yeah. I um, I didn't realize that they had expanded it even even further. I I'd had had heard that for this one because the stepmother didn't previously have a, a song mm -hmm. and since they had cast Bernadette Peters that they had brought something from another part of their catalog because you can't have Bernadette Peters and not allow her to shine you know yep. fully so 
So yeah, yeah um, they, had done, they did. They added that the opening song that's a duet between the prince and Cinderella was new. Uh, the musical kind of starts with the princess giving a ball yes. um, in the original, and then okay. um, there is music in you was added. There's I feel like there's one other song that they added to this um, pulled from other Rodgers and Hammerstein things that weren't as well known um, to get the runtime up, uh, which is kind of interesting to think about that then this this version of it that was really, you know, led by Whitney Houston and Disney's TV production team went on to also inspire the Broadway version um, that came, you know, more than 50 years after the original Julie Andrews version. Now, did the Broadway version embrace the color palette? I mean, because this, the, the colors musical. on this are astounding. Yeah, the version that we saw, like the stage adaptation of it was much more connected to nature. And I think that was partially for how they would do their effects. So they had a lot of trees and, and they would kind of move around and then they would turn around and become pillars in the palace. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then also those trees would like crisscross. And so you'd have like a character transformation, um, obviously with a double, but like, you know, the trees would cross, cross in front of them and then it looked like- Correct, same yeah. Person standing there gotcha. in the same outfit um so that kind of stuff so it was it was much more earthy uh earth tones and and white and and like cinderella's dress in that was white her ball dress okay uh, was a white dress not any shade of blue but i do love that um color palette that they went through for the ball where pretty much every character except uh the stepsisters the stepmother and cinderella are in these like violet uh baby blue hues mm -hmm. um and I remember my older brother was uh, played guitar and took guitar lessons at a music store. And they always had sheet music for sale. And they had the piano book and the cover for that was the image of the ball dancers, none of the actors from the film because they probably had to pay for their likeness. So it was just this establishing shot from the ball of all the dancers in their costumes. I always thought that was funny. I love, I love the costumes. I loved mm -hmm the colors that that were used um the especially the um the king maximilian mm. his yeah, uh, the, like royal the, purples and yeah and, and, the, gold. and the brilliant um like a magenta it's uh, not quite it's like brighter than a magenta mm -hmm. and then um and then the uh stepsisters um uh dresses um, well, the, the stepmother, especially that blue with the golden like scroll, so pretty. Um, I was gonna ask you, did you think, okay, see this movie is like a movie that you've grown up with. So you have, so this was, I was looking at Fresh Eyes, but mm -hmm. when they first walked into the, the stepmother's house and there's like the staircase and the way, it totally reminded me of um, Tangled. Mm. The way the art, the way the artwork was, and just the palette of colors and everything—that's yeah. where that's where I was I was taken, and I wondered if, if if it worked in reverse, if like when you had seen Tangled, did it remind you of of I this? I didn't instantly think of this when I saw Tangled, but it's very Art Nouveau um, in just even like the shape of the doorway and everything. Um, and so I guess I I just kind of equated it to that because I would also say parts of like Naboo in the Phantom Menace, okay. kind of the same a similar aesthetic, not as gaudy as as they take it because you know obviously I think an extension of what they wear uh, gets applied to the furniture and yes. the decor and the paint on the walls. But it's just funny how like all of the stepsisters' costumes have like a big gem. So, like there's like just like in the hemline, like all these gems that you would find at like a craft store and like glue in, um, which I always think is funny. And, and when I see jewelry like that, uh, mostly on HSN or QVC, I think of these are the girls that they were trying to sell it to. <laughs> Very good. But I, I do love right. that they, they definitely tried to pay homage color palette wise for at least the stepsisters, stepmother and Cinderella to the animated versions. Because um, you have the two stepsisters in green and pink. Right. You've got the stepmother in kind of a royal blue. And then oh, Cinderella's yeah. dress is obviously, you know, kind of this silvery blue um, or blue with silver accents. We know it's really supposed to be silver, but nobody else does. So, <laughs> okay. So, so you were talking about, I'm going to share a picture with you. Sure. Um, because you were talking about um, my love of Cinderella. Okay. 
I, I hate to dress up. When I was mm -hmm. little, my mother would talk about how she put me in a little dress and I would scream until she took it off. Well, there came a point in my life where I had to attend a formal, so I had to get a fancy dress. So I got one that was as close to Cinderella as I could possibly find. See, so it's like a little, kind of a pale blue, mm -hmm. has a little bit of the flare out, has kind of the gather. Like I say, it was about as close to Cinderella as I could find. Cause if you're gonna make me get dressed up, at least I'm gonna look like the princess I love. So, mm -hmm. so there you go, a proof of my uh, Cinderella fascination from a young age. <laughs> 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 Very cool. Yeah, and the, the Disney Cinderella was one, in terms of like my introduction to it, I think I probably saw Cinderella Castle at Disney World before I ever got to see the full film. I think I was introduced to it more in pieces through like the Disney sing-alongs because my parents had missed the Black Diamond Classic release. And so I had to wait for the Masterpiece Edition to be available. <laughs> um, and I was much more consciously aware of like Sleeping, or I'm sorry, Lady and the Tramp as a movie that like okay. I was aware of and didn't own and wanted than I was with Cinderella. So my introduction to the Disney Cinderella came probably later, I was maybe like eight or nine um, by the time I first saw it, like all the way through from start to finish, which probably wasn't much later or, or around the same time I saw Snow White for the first time in like 93 when mm -hmm. they brought that out. So um, I feel like I was introduced to the Disney Cinderella too late in life to like really have it mean that much to me. Obviously I love it right. and, and you know, have a lot of respect for it and, and especially what it did for the history of the company. Um, but this version of Cinderella is probably the one where, you know, I saw it and I was just like, this is awesome and, and obsessed over it for a, t a period of time and uh, got into, I mean, I was already familiar with Sound of Music, but this kind of was okay. my gateway drug into the rest of the Rodgers and Hammerstein catalog. Cause so I was like, if they did Sound of Music and this, what else do they got? <laughs> you know, ah. started renting others from Blockbuster. Oh, very cool. Oklahoma, that's them, yep. right? Yep, Oklahoma, yeah. South Pacific, Carousel, which is my mm -hmm. favorite, um, but not everybody loves it. It's not everyone's cup of tea. Um, a lot of great ones. South, or, uh, State Fair, which was their one made for the screen instead of for the stage and mm -hmm. adapted. Mm -hmm. Wow, amazing music, wow. Yeah. Um, the other thing I was going to ask you is, did it, did it, um, no, I don't want to say bother you, but did you, did you ever think it humorous the way in like, you know, superhero movies, you have like Clark Kent, you know, he like has the glasses and then he takes the glasses off and like nobody realizes it's the same person. And mm. here she like, puts on a fancy dress and an updo and and he, and he doesn't immediately recognize her as the the girl on the street and and is, she doesn't seem to really recognize him either right I yeah mean, i thought that was interesting so in in Kenneth Branagh's adaptation i feel like they kind of borrowed from this a little bit cuz this is the first version of Cinderella i've ever seen where she and the prince meet in the village as commoners or, or, or meet outside the palace as commoners and then um, meet up later at the ball. This version doesn't really address the fact that they've met before or, or have a moment of recognition until mm -hmm. really the end when he gets to bring her the shoe. I feel like that's when it kind of comes full circle. Whereas in the Kenneth Branagh version, she meets him at the ball and doesn't know he's the prince. And that's kind of the twist that they put there. Um, but I do, I do like that they have that development. I feel like, I feel like it's a very '90s thing that has become, you know, necessary today. Is I feel like by the end of the '90s, when this was made, is when you started to get criticism from parent groups about mm -hmm. some of the Disney movies where a character meets their love at first sight and suddenly is married um, without any like actual romantic development. So here, it at least gives you that in a way that probably was just to appease those parent groups that were starting to get vocal at the time. Um, but now it's like essential, like Tangled couldn't have been made with the ending it has unless she and Flynn Rider went on that voyage, that journey together, you know, yeah. um, just because we've become so much more sensitive to, um, to that. Right, right, yeah. Even though the fairy tale source material that all these come from is just, you know, Prince wakes her up with a kiss, they ride off to yeah. the temple. Yeah. yeah. Well, that was one of the that was one of the things that I found a little fresh, a little bit frustrating in a way to me. Mm. The the beginning introduction to Cinderella because mm. 
in the Disney one, I I feel like there's this girl who's seemingly trapped. Um, in the animated one, mm-hmm. there's this girl who's seemingly trapped, and she's kind of making the best of a really bad situation. Right? That's how she comes off. She really doesn't have have a way out. She's making the best of a situation, and she greets each day, and and she's you know uh, making friends with these little critters and and that kind of thing. And mm-hmm. that ends up to me, the thought is that ends up being the groundwork that she's laid. So when the opportunity comes for her to escape, because of those efforts that she'd been putting in, she has this team of critters that help her escape. Okay. She had even made a dress to go to the ball that was destroyed by her. You know, it was like people kept getting in the way of her making progress. It wasn't that she was not trying to make progress. Mm -hmm. Whereas in this circumstance and in other Cinderella's that I see, I feel like sometimes the Cinderella character is like even a little bit more complacent or apathetic within their circumstances to the point where in this one, I feel, you know, the, the fairy godmother in essence, you know, says, get out there nobody's in your way go do it i've given you all this stuff go mm-hmm. and i just it was just an interesting difference considering kind of growing up how much negativity i would get because of uh my enjoyment of cinderella and uh, people's perceptions of what of what cinderella was of in that 50s version well and i feel like that speaks kind of to a a difference in the characterization of Cinderella between these two versions too. I mean, the Disney version of it is a character who, in spite of all of the obstacles in her way and things that should keep her down and make her feel um, depressed and insignificant, um, she doesn't let them and and she keeps her her, um, optimism and her hope alive um, through it all. In this version, it's almost like um, she's at the same place as the prince. I mean, obviously now we're we're in the wake of like Oprah's big interview, um, and I think <laughs> oh, we, all see, we all see what's you know what's really like to be a royal. So mm-hmm. in this version, it almost makes sense that you know the prince is kind of feeling just as trapped in his yes. life as Cinderella does, and it gives them this thing to bond over. But gotcha. I agree with I agree with that. The opening number of this is really two characters singing about like ho hum, my life's not great because and relating to each other that way. Yeah. Um, and, I, then yeah. Her, and then her song about being in her corn, you know, in essence, I, I have this mm-hmm. little corner here where I, I, I feel comfortable and safe. And it's just a very different, a very different characterization than mm-hmm. the one that, you know, is the one that kind of I defined what Cinderella what was for me. But then on the flip side, um, I really enjoy the trans the transformation with with the fairy godmother and kind of that spunk rather than dimwittedness of mm-hmm. um of Whitney Houston versus the animated uh, delightfully um, round one. Yeah, yeah. Here, here, Whitney Houston is almost this omnipresent being who you know just knows exactly what what she needs. Whereas that one is like, I was sent here by the fairy godmother agency and I don't know what I'm doing and I'm woefully (laughs) unprepared for this moment. Um, You know, and they kept that kind of spirit intake for uh, the Helena Bonham Carter adaptation. Yes, yes they did. She's Mm -hmm. still just like, what am I doing again? Oh yeah. (laughs) Whereas Whitney's take is very much like, I know exactly what you need and I know how to get it. But I also feel in some ways like that's part of what makes this version res- resonate um, so much, particularly, you know, with the audience that I think Whitney Houston was hoping it would really speak to, um, which was a lot of black girls in America, particularly, um, you know, and and just in this time where we're, you know, talking about systems in place to kind of keep people down. You have this story where, you know, Brandy is Cinderella in this mm-hmm. position that's being, you know, forced on her and, you know, she gets this opportunity and takes it and, you know, goes off to have this better life and they're going to go do her laundry now. <laughs> she locked them out of the, the gates. Because that's the other thing in the Disney version, you never see the stepmother and stepsisters get any kind of a comeuppance. And here yes. you have that moment where they're like, let us Come in, we're mm-hmm. sorry. Like, <laughs> yeah, no, it's true. It's true. The other, the other thing about the this production that I think is special, and Brandy mentions it in the interviews, is not only is it Brandy, but it's Brandy as Brandy. Mm-hmm. They didn't, they didn't transform her. She, she wore her hair a lot of times in that era with braids, and mm-hmm. she kept those braids in this production. 
And yep. in fact, when she they did the Todrick Hall did like this promotional video, she came and the two of them sang at the piano. Um, mm -hmm. You know, she has those signature braids um, in, in that as well. And I just, it's one of those things where based upon the way she talked about it, that was of great import and it meant, it meant something to her. And I think that that's a, a really special choice that, that the, the team that brought this to life made. And I think it resonated um, with the audience. And I think little, some of the littler touches like that, I think is part of what, you know, keeps it, keeps it be connecting um, all these years later. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's certainly, certainly very special. And um, again, even though Disney made many musicals for the wonderful world of Disney based off the success of this, not only in ratings, but the video sales after they put it out on VHS continued to be high. And um, of that era, it's one of the few uh, Wonderful World of Disney movies that they released on DVD as well. I think it was this, Annie, and then Once Upon a Mattress. Mm -hmm. uh, and like Geppetto didn't get a wide DVD release. A lot of the other ones um, kind of like faded into obscurity. Uh, but this one, it's like the Snow White of that era of ABC television musicals. Um, there was even a South Pacific that was aimed more at adults with Glenn Close, um, a re revival of that. So okay. um, all these in, this, yeah. in the wake of this. Now, do you, are there stories out there as to why we don't have a soundtrack available? There are, um, it stemmed from the fact that Brandy and Whitney Houston were both on different record labels, okay. both with, you know, in the prime of recording contracts and Disney wanting to be the one to release said album and the fees for getting that done were absorbently high. It's the kind of thing where now, all these years later, you would expect it could be done, but I think in the wake of Whitney Houston's death and having another team actually managing her assets and her catalog, that might make it more difficult. I know um, Queen did a song with, did a couple songs actually with Michael Jackson in the 80s that never got released. And one of them finally saw the light of day a couple years ago. The other two have still never been released with Michael Jackson's vocals on them. And I, my understanding is the main reason is that his estate is um, really demanding and, and wants a lot out of it. And yeah. uh, so I, I'm guessing that kind of plays into it as well. It's sort of the same reason why we've never gotten a professional release of Bette Midler's I Put a Spell on You. Um, from Hocus Pocus, uh, because at the time she was signed, I think, with Warner Brothers, and they wanted, you know, anything released by uh, her on their label, and they were like, well, we're not releasing the Hocus Pocus soundtrack on Warner Brothers records, um, so they just never put that song out, till, still to this day. But I think, for me, that's pro a little bit plays into how it kind of isn't on, wasn't on my radar, per se, because it, mm -hmm. it, you, it, I didn't hear the, the songs kind of pop up every now and again on my, you know, uh, on a, a CD, you know, cause you know, you grab a CD, throw it in and be like, oh yeah. And then go, yeah. you know, go catch the film again, kind of thing. Well, and this is also, I mean, this is like seven years before iTunes becomes right. a big deal. Like this is right at the dawning of like Napster. So it's like mm -hmm. a little early for digital sales to, to be such where they could easily justify, um, you know, making these kinds of record deals. But at the time, you know, you had to go into your Sam Goody to their little singles <laughs> section. Not many stores had those, you know, if you were getting a single. Yeah. Um, and even the sales of soundtracks weren't, you know, usually that stellar unless they won a lot of awards, you know, like Lion King's one of the few exceptions where the soundtrack sales made the billboard charts, you know? Right, um, right, of course. So I'm sure they just looked at it and they were like, there's no way to justify paying. <laughs> um, but Well, Brandy in the interviews as this, when this hit the news that, you know, it was coming back um, in February, she dropped hints in interviews that, that it, she was hoping it would happen soon. You know, it was one mm. of those things you got the impression that somebody was still thinking about the possibility. So it wasn't and hadn't totally disappeared as an idea. Who yeah. knows whether or not they'll that'll, you know, have success. But it, you know, at least it at least she is still aware and kind of, you know, working towards making that available. Cause I can't imagine how much that would mean to people, you know, and mm -hmm. and uh, it'd be be great to have that music out there. I don't not have the music in my iTunes, but of it course. has dialogue over it. <laughs> so I would definitely upgrade um, and pay the you know price of an album to Disney for it if uh, they could make that happen. So. Now, are you able to name the prince and all of his names? So um, I can get pretty far. Uh, 
And that, by the way, is something that was invented for this version. You don't find oh, okay. it in the other versions. Even okay. on, on Broadway, they didn't give him a bajillion names. But His Royal Highness Christopher Rubin, son of His Majesty, of Her Majesty, Queen Constantina, something, Vladimir, Carl Alexander, Gregory James, something Maximilian. You're getting a lot of them in there. I know. I, I've seen this many, many times. <laughs> but, but I know the moment. I have it written down as Prince Christopher Rupert Windermere Vladimir Carl Alexander Francois Reginald Lancelot Herman, Herman Gregory, James. Gregory James and then <laughs> James Jason uh, Jason Alexander adds another one each time he sings it ending yeah. with Sydney. Okay. <laughs> like, and when, I will say when we got Nemo, our our first dog, uh, I kept extending his name with a lot of middle names. I've lost most of them now, but inspired by this. Yeah. I did that with my dog, not inspired yeah. by this, but I did that with my dog. My dog was Princess Snow White, and then I would just periodically add another princess. And so mm. over time, she had a lot of names. Yep. And I always just called her princess. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, I was, I, 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 uh, I love that so much that I, I, again, ingrain it into my own personal life all the time. <laughs> so do you have a favorite moment from the, from the production? Um. Yes, I mean, I, I love the stepsisters in particular and, and the, the stepmother. Um, okay. I, I think, I, I know you said the stepsisters number reminded you a lot of the Happy Working song, but I really love their uh, banter and the way they like grab each other's head and pull them down under the shrubs um, and all of that. Um, even just- Their chemistry the, is amazing. Their chemistry Those is really sisters good. sisters is amazing. And there are just weird little moments like when they're all commanding her around and it's, you know, Cinderella, my hat, Cinderella, my gloves, you know, all yes. of those that just have stuck with me. Um, so I guess not one specific moment, but there's so many that are just kind of continuously in my head. It's kind of like Hocus Pocus where, um, you know, just like different things in life remind me of a moment and I'll quote it and, you know, uh, unlike Hocus Pocus, which now everyone knows, this is one where people still look at me like, what are you what are you quoting? Why is that why is that so relevant? And um, you know, it's nice to know that with Disney Plus it's getting a lot more visibility. Because this also, I will say, had a lot of repeat airings on Disney Channel for a while. And then by about the mid 2000s probably due to having to pay rights, um, they stopped airing it. And so okay. it kind of disappeared for a while. And it was like you had to either own it on VHS or DVD, or it wasn't really available. Uh and uh, no, you're correct. Who doesn't love Bernadette Peters? I mean, yeah. the, well, the. I got to see her um, with Victor Garber in Hello Dolly on Broadway. And it was one of those moments where I was just, you know, again, my Rodgers and Hammerstein Cinderella uh, fandom really jumped out and came alive because I was like, uh, Let's you together again on stage. Oh. <laughs> uh. That would be amazing. That would yeah. be really cool. So I had, so I enjoyed uh, pr pretty much anytime Jason Alexander was on screen, I mm -hmm. I, I was just enthralled. But then um, the um, Whoopi Goldberg's reactions to oh, her yeah. son. <laughs> oh, I can't get as high as she does. <laughs> it was just her reactions as the queen disappointed or concerned about the possibility of of her son not marrying or not having you know grandchildren as it mm -hmm. seemed you know it was really really just a voice only dogs could hear and yes. i loved and, it and that's something she improvised um joking around on the set and then the director heard it and he was like you have to do this and they kind of revised those scenes to make it a running gag for her. Um, I love her as well. And there's a moment after, like at the end of the ball, Jason Alexander has been trampled by all the girls. He's on the floor. She and the king are walking by. She's like, who is that? And he's like, Lionel. And she's like, oh. And, and they just keep walking, like not a care in the world over him. <laughs> I also love, I mean, again, there's just so many moments. The part when Bernadette Peters is trying to come on to him and she's like, you know, listing off his attributes. And she goes, and that great big head of Skin. And she like <laughs> starts to like curl her finger around in what would be hair. Yes. Um, so many good moments. Oh, and I with this moment with the ladder, I thought Victor mm. Garber. I was like, oh, poor Jason Allen. It seemed like he kind of got him a little tough there, shoving him into the wall of that ladder. Yep. I was like that one felt like it hurt. I have mm -hmm. to say though, there was I had a cringe moment mm. in, in this, and that okay. was when Cinderella and the prince are are dancing together at the ball. And okay. the king and queen are watching 
and the king. Oh, and then he has his line. Well, I, <laughs> if, if I, I were, were a younger, younger man. man. <laughs> but I also love her reaction. Like that's one of my, it's one of the funniest moments because she's like, yes. And he's like, well, I'd be younger, you know? <laughs> and he like sits back. Um, so yes, it is, it is cringeworthy for the right reasons, but also <laughs> funny. Yes. Uh, you know, and also very Hollywood. I mean, that's oh, totally. still a joke in Hollywood, like in oh, Mr. Yeah. Mayor on NBC when, when you know, he, he, Ted Danson is with his like 16 year old daughter and someone says, and this is your wife? <laughs> and, right. You know, cause it's LA and that's just. Yeah. No, it was one of those things where it didn't, it didn't, I didn't, I felt like if I had have watched it as a young person, I wouldn't have thought of it in the same way. But mm -hmm. now as a, as a parent, Yep. And like I, I kind of just go, oh yeah, okay. Well, I'm glad mom. I'm glad mom stopped. You know, it's like I'm. I'm glad your wife had your back and stopped you mm -hmm. before you continued down that discussion path because that wasn't going to end well. <laughs> oh, did you hear the story about Whoopi's jewelry? By the way, okay. In reading about Whoopi's jewelry, I saw reports. I saw estimates of the value of the jewelry, like all over the place. So I would love to hear what story you're going to share about well, the jewelry. She, she reaffirms it in that Entertainment Weekly um, live uh, reunion. Uh, so you can kind of hear the full story there. But she was adamant that she wear real jewels if she's playing the queen. She didn't want, you know, costume jewelry. And she's friends with Harry Winston's son. So okay. she made a call. And so these jewels were brought to her every day. And like someone would stand by on set with like a briefcase. And then like at the end of wrapping, they would like put it all back and they'd lock it up and take it back to their, their vault. So she was wearing over a million dollars of jewelry yeah. in all of her scenes between like the necklace, the earrings and the crown, um, which were all real precious metals and stones, <laughs> um, nothing fake, which I think is funny in these shots where you then have the stepsisters in like Craft, really gaudy baubles that clearly mm -hmm. came from Michaels and were were glued on to you know the most reflective satiny material that they could get at Joanne's, um, and it's funny in that that uh, reunion too to hear them talk about the budget and how like there really wasn't time for a lot of the things that you would typically get on a on a bigger movie production. Mm -hmm. So you know we talk about the camaraderie between the stepsisters and Bernadette Peters, and they really didn't have much time before the camera started rolling to kind of nail that down. But you know just the the chemistry of having the right people in those roles really worked out and um, you know lent itself well to something that's just really fun to watch again and again and again for someone like me. <laughs> the, the two stories that stuck out to me during those retrospectives, one of them was be, um, that Whoopi told regarding um, her interactions with Brandy. And that was that, well, I know I think Brandy actually shared it. And that was that uh, Whoopi Goldberg had told her that, that about the connection with Harry Winston's son and in essence told her, make friends, make connections. Mm -hmm. And then somebody will bring you jewels someday, yeah. <laughs> you know, and I, I just thought that was really fun. You know, here's this young um, actor, you know, this is one of her first kind of actress roles in, in beyond mm -hmm. her Moesha. And just to, you know, have someone like Whoopi to kind of offer, offer that uh, experiential device, you know, uh, ex experienced advice, mm -hmm. I, I thought was very sweet. And then the other one was a, a story that Jason Alexander shared about the recording. And that was that he said that Whitney and um, Brandy were recording impossible. I think it was impossible. Mm. And that um, Whitney had done one of her beautiful, you know, uh, uh, vocal, uh, you know, flourishes that she, yeah. she adds. And when it was, and when she was done, I guess Brandy had said, oh, that was so beautiful. Please, please, you know, do that in the, in the record. That that's beautiful. I love it. And Whitney was like, are you sure? And she, yeah, and 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 Brandy was so engaged with it and encouraging to it that even though you know Whitney was the long-standing established artist, that in that moment Brandy was able to you know be that voice to her to you know kind of give it the yeah go for it, and that meant something you know that meant something to Brandy. You could tell in in recounting the story, but it you could see that it had touched Jason Alexander too, kind of in that moment to see someone of Whitney's stature embrace the encouragement from a, a up and comer as it were. So I thought that was a sweet story connected with, with this. And I think it kind of, and I think that kind of plays in this on screen too, just their mm -hmm. own chemistry 
fairy godmother and 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 Cinderella. Yeah, and she and Whitney Houston and Deborah Martin Chase um, co-produced the first Princess Diaries, and um, you know one of my favorite stories out of that production is uh, Gary Marshall had a birthday while they were filming, and so Whitney Houston and Julie Andrews did a duet of Happy Birthday for him um, on the set of that, which I think is really cool. A um, little off topic for this version of Cinderella, but uh, somewhere there's a bonus feature that people can watch of, of Whitney Houston and Julie Andrews singing Happy Birthday to Gary Marshall. Um, it's very special. Oh, do you know, um, oh, sorry, you're putting that up. <laughs> no, I, I pulled it up as you put it up. <laughs> um, they have released some behind the scenes footage. The DVD release had one of the interstitials that Disney Channel used to play um, that kind of showed them rehearsing the ballroom scene, showed a little bit of the recording. And there was a moment um, shown in there where Brand where Whitney Houston was telling Brandy to like get bigger on, on Impossible um, because Whitney was going to go with her big voice. And so she needed Brandy to kind of like match her. Um, and she was seeing it a little bit quieter. Um, so there's some fun little moments from behind the scenes that have been release there, but um, sadly no deleted scenes, um, no bloopers um, that I've seen from the set, which you're, you know, there must have been some really fun and funny moments um, just given the cast involved. Um, and I think part of that is just because it was made for TV. It got a quick little VHS release. And then a couple years later at the advent of DVD, they, they threw it on a disc with one of the Disney Channel little promo pieces and um, called it a day. And then there really hasn't been much in the way of Ro Disney's Rodgers and Hammerstein Cinderella um, love until now um, when, you know, kind of like Hocus Pocus, which I loved in 1993. And then it took a while for people to catch on, um, you know, this suddenly, grew in in its fandom. Um, so maybe we'll see something someday. One thing I will say is it, the print that they have on Disney Plus um, looks really good. They took the video source and they de-interlaced it. Sometimes there are some weird things um, going on where like a character, like even like trees in the background look like they're moving funny. And it's because of that de-interlacing process. Um, but the visual effects, I wish, could be done better because some of them obviously were were you know cutting edge for the time, but now look really cheap. And um, and there are moments where it's like you know you're you're swept up in the high quality of the acting and the costumes and the sets, and then a, a cheap CG effect comes in, and you're like, oh yeah, this was made for TV. <laughs> So, I think it gets uh, you out. <laughs> yeah, I don't normally support the like special edition of of like going back in and redoing your visual effects, but this is one where I would I would say if they did it, I wouldn't hate it. Okay. Just keep the like swirly design of of the fairy godmother's magic, and I'll be happy. <laughs> so he gives a stamp of approval for a somewhat yeah. Disney somewhat has my edited. blessing to special ah. edition <laughs> Rogers Hammerstein Cinderella. So you, there, there <laughs> you go. the original cut available just in case we don't love it oh but yeah and no, it's just it's a very magical piece i mean it it, it, re it really is every once in a while there's a, a a collection of of artists who come together and and in some ways what they created is even like more than what it is on paper you know mm -hmm. it's it, it's like you know you you don't point to a single moment or a single element and be like that's the best I've ever seen of of X, but yet all of these pieces coming coming together made something really really special, and I'm I'm happy that it's finally available to people on Disney Plus. Yeah, and to wrap it up, I'm curious to know because this has I've always said this is my favorite live action version of Cinderella, um, but I'm curious to know for you, like where does this rank amongst the live action Cinderellas that you've seen? Well, I preferred this. The last one that I'd seen was the the Bre Brenna one, mm -hmm. and I and I very much prefer this this Cinderella um, to that for sure. Um, just, and I, and I mean just like the def the, the character, the defined character mm -hmm. of Cinderella. I, I found I found this character, this Cinderella, uh, much more uh, relatable, um, and uh, enjoyed her her uh, journey more than I did uh, what was created Lily with uh, Lily James. Yeah. That, that's not um, my cup of tea. Someday I will rant about it on here for everybody. But sure. Someday today, we'll do, today, today is not that problem. day. Today is the day to celebrate Brandy. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I think I think of the ones I was trying. I I found this one the more rewatchable than I expected it it to be. 
Um, but wow, did that, I found that, that the moment with the Prince love song was just a total, for me, that's a total like dead zone. Oh, for, um, for the, the second song they sing, the Do I Love You Because You're Wonderful um, song? Yeah. Okay, because yeah. I love the 10 Minutes Ago song, but I, I would agree with that. And when you think about, you know, in the 50s, they're just trying to make an hour long yeah, uh, like, special about this, um, this very short fairy tale uh, prior to Disney's adaptation. Um, yeah. You can kind of see it was like, okay, we just had a love song. Here's another love song. This one's not as good as that last love song, but it fills the time. Yeah, I, I agree with that. So I was kind <laughs> of like, they did reprise it with the queen as well, where she sings it back to him. So yeah. I can understand that. Yeah, it is so, definitely the, the weakest song. In the, so that was kind of a moment for me. I was like, wow, okay, this is dragging a bit. But, yeah. You know, it's okay, <laughs> it's all good. But they built this really pretty garden set and they're gonna use it. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. Um but over but overall I was I I think the costuming and the and the sets for me, I, I mean mm. I really I really enjoyed the costuming. I loved um Cinderella's dress at the ball. Mm -hmm. I the other print the other you know gathered maidens from the land I loved what I'd let uh, the color the palette I was I saw a tweet from somebody when this was you know like a watch it with us party mm. and somebody and somebody you know had tweeted in the midst of that um you know I'm getting married next month and everybody needs to wear something from the color palette of this film yeah. <laughs> these are like, my these are my bridesmaids colors now. And I'm like, I am so, I'm so there. I loved, yeah. cause it's so bright and beautiful and yeah. So it, it you know, it, it, it's funny. It reminds me of Magic Happens, the parade mm. of Disneyland that I adore. Well, and as you know, Todrick Hall is a huge fan <laughs> of this version. Uh, <laughs> and also a, uh, one of the like people who make custom dolls, he commissioned custom dolls that look just like Brandy and Whitney Houston from this movie. Oh, is it they were on Instagram. They were in his video. Oh, were they? Yeah, that video that he did with Brandy that's so mm. beautiful. It's so brilliant. You should totally, as a fan of this movie, yeah, you should go it find it. It is magic. So magic. Magic. He's happens. got it. He's got he's got his uh leather red boots kind of in the background. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, no, it, it hits all these nice little nice little points of, of order in both of their lives. It's really oh, cool. lovely. Neat. Um but yeah, no, as a huge fan of um, his uh, magic happens to stumble on that video. And just now, like you say, I'm putting the pieces together. Hmm, I wonder. <laughs> I wonder uh, that's where you got this. Yeah, Cool. I'd like well, to think so. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know um, what's next on the radar for LP Movie Club? I just realized I, I'm not prepared. No, I don't, but I can pull it up if you want to vamp about something else for a moment. Oh, I um, I have been told by my my off-screen producer. Oh, um, I have one of those. Week you can join us for uh, National Geographic's Own the Room, a new documentary film that just premiered uh, this past Friday. So you can watch that. Join us next Monday at 7.30 p.m. Pacific time uh, to discuss Own the Room. And uh, we have... Barely Necessities and uh, Disney Trivia Live coming Ooh. tomorrow on Barely Necessities. Oh, there is so much stuff that's been hit, hitting the uh, sh the shelves, so to speak. So Becca and I are trying to sift through it and figure out what we're going to share with everybody. But uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar, Barely Necessities is LaughingPlace.com's uh, Disney merchandise show. We do our best to let you know what's out there that you can, you know, the things you uh, barely need but absolutely must have. And then at 7.30 will be Disney Trivia Live, uh, my husband and son, host a live trivia game where you get to play head to head against uh, fellow Disney fans and, uh, you know, talk, uh, find out who knows a lot about uh, all things Disney. Hmm. Do you think this Cinderella will be, it has been right. It, it, they, yes. Do they perform it every so often? Actually you saw Kiki. No, I saw, you did it. Kiki I saw it with Carly Rae Jepsen and Fran Drescher, but shortly after that Kiki Palmer and Sherry Shepard um, took over the roles. So Rogers and Hammerstein did a Broadway version of Cinderella. Um, about four or five years ago, it finished its run on Broadway and it was still touring when theater stopped last March. Okay. Um, so there's still a website for it. It's um, They have a kind of a purple color scheme. So if you Google uh, Rodgers and Hammerstein Cinderella um, 
musical Broadway, you'll probably find that website. And I'm sure when they are ready to resume touring, um, you can find out where. And uh, they have uh, over time done some colorblind casting and it is this Rodgers and Hammerstein's music. The story is a little bit different, but they were inspired by elements of the Whitney Houston Brandy version when they developed that stage version. So you can kind of see um, some of the some of the pieces that they borrowed from this adaptation, if you compare it with the earlier versions with Julie Andrews and Leslie Ann Warren as Cinderella from the 50s and 60s. Wow. Um, all of which I think the I think the Julie Andrews version is on Amazon Prime streaming now. I know the Leslie Ann Warren version has come and gone on streaming, but it might be there now. And um, fun story about the Leslie Ann Warren version is Pat Carroll, the voice of Ursula, is one of the stepsisters, um, and oh, she sounds okay. just like Ursula as a stepsister. So oh, that is fun. Oh, yeah. definitely fun. Um, yeah, I for me um, that version defines Disney Channel click show for me. Whenever mm -hmm. that was like when I was watching Disney Channel and it would go to that, I would turn. I don't, oh, I don't, yeah. I don't know what it was about that, but that that well, was what it I was. I will say that version. It's like the sets are really minimalistic. Like everything is flat. You know, it kind of feels. It feels almost like an amateur production, even though it has like Leslie Ann Warren and Pat Carroll and some fairly big names in it. Um, so just the staging, the costumes are a little bland. Um, for my taste in, in both of the previous adaptations. Un unless it was the song Impossible, then I couldn't turn it. Yeah, that song's great. Because the song's it's, just great. It's best when Whitney Houston sings it. It really is. <laughs> I I will not, I will not uh, uh, fight that. And now I really want to watch it again to totally uh, memorize and internalize the way she talks about ridiculous stuff. Oh yeah, Falder. Her, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I enjoyed I enjoyed that a lot, and I I would like to, uh, yeah. You pull those. I would I would like to have those become part of my lexicon when people are <laughs> are saying nonsense. To me. Yep. So, oh Great. well. <laughs> Thank you for this. This was fun because yeah. I don't I don't know that I I would have you know kind of you know gotten and and finally pushed play on this. So I I appreciate the. Uh, the open invitation to join a movie club. And when I saw Cinderella, I, I clicked before I even knew which one I was going to be watching. I'm like, eh, <laughs> it'll be Cinderella. I'll get to talk about it with my pal, Alex. So it'll, it'll be good, whatever one I end up watching. And then yeah. it was like, oh, the one with Brandy. Well, I hadn't I'm seen glad, it yet. I'm glad you've seen it now, because I know I've been talking about it since you've known me. So. I know, yeah, exactly. Very, very cool. Oh, oh, thanks. Oh, yeah. Oh, no, go ahead. I was just going to I was gonna say farewell. I figured you, oh, were, yeah. you were getting ready to say goodbye. That's where I was going. Uh, thanks to everyone who's who watched and commented and joined along. Uh, hope everyone has a great day. 